Man, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 in just a minute. We're going to read in verse 26. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. So this past week, Thursday, I had the opportunity to uh, preview a movie that's coming out on Tuesday. I would encourage you to see it. The name of the movie is Emmanuel. It's a documentary uh, representing the fourth anniversary of the shootings at Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. A lot to say about the film, but I'll let you see it and experience it for yourself. But let me share one remarkable anecdote. That in an unprecedented way, during the trial, the man who had killed uh, nine people there in the church who was invited or just came in off the street to attend a Bible study, actually attended the Bible study, sat through it for a half hour before he did what he did. Um, And what was really an unprecedented move, the judge allowed the victims to speak to the accused. There was a lady there who had saved her granddaughter, but in the process lost her son. He was killed there. Here's what she said to him. She said, I want you, I'm paraphrasing, this is pretty close, I want you to call out to Jesus because the same blood that covers me can cover you. I want you to call out to Jesus because the same blood that covers me can cover you. Now, a lot to think about there. That's incredible on so many different layers. But first of all, just this layer, here is someone who has lost her son at the hands of someone who admittedly committed a hate crime just because of their race, and she is seeking out that he find forgiveness and hope in God. Remarkable. And this is, this is really the problem for the atheist. <laughs> you have to either believe that she has some strange neurosis, that she's psychotic, that she would say that, or that there is a power of forgiveness that she has received that is so powerful that she can actually extend it to others in the worst of circumstances. Remarkable. The other thing that's remarkable is this, is that in this moment where he's receiving justice, she says that the same blood that covers me, in other words, acknowledging that she's a sinner too, that same blood that covers me, and I've never killed anyone, that same blood that covers me can also cover you. She she has full comprehension of what she does. She feels it in a way that we can't feel it. And yet she says that actually there's a court that's higher than this one. And that court that's higher than this one, even though you may lose your life in this life, you can actually be saved in the next life. What a remarkable thought. Now, how could that be? How could God extend forgiveness to someone like that? Well, actually, there's no way that that would be possible unless someone would call out to God and find in mercy that God would allow a mediator, a priest, to go between you and between God to extend mercy to us. In other words, the whole plan of God of salvation, of coming to Christ, becoming a Christian, becoming saved, whatever you want to say, it all hinges on someone, since God is inaccessible by ourselves, someone going to God on our behalf. It all hinges on that. And so... Here's what Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 says. Here's the encouraging part. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. So there's there's someone like that. We have that. Look how the rest of the verse reads. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. We have a priest who is exalted above the heavens. The significance of that is is that that's where God is, exalted above the heavens. Now look at chapter 8 and verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. He's picking up on that same idea. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. Let me review. This would be a good time to do it. A little bit of what we've seen in the book of Hebrews. So remember chapter 1. Verses 1 through 4, Jesus is better. He's better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. They spoke little words, but he's the final complete word of God. Therefore, chapter 2 and verse 1, we have to really pay attention, really listen to Jesus, because if we don't, we might drift away. And if God held people accountable for what the prophets said and the angels said, how much more will God hold us accountable for the very words of Jesus himself? 
Then in chapter 3, he introduces this interesting idea that in the same way that Moses brought the law, but the law was weak, Jesus is greater than Moses, which is significant because Moses was the means by which the law came, but Jesus is greater. And then at the end of chapter 4, he introduces this idea that he hasn't seen before in verse 14, that Jesus is a great high priest. Not just a priest, a high priest, but not just a high priest, a great high priest. So the idea is that we have a a super priest. We might say it this way, a supreme priest. So now we're getting the idea of why could guilty sinners go free? Because standing in their stead is someone who is mediating, pleading their case before the Father. And then he wants to tease out this idea in chapter 5 and verse 11 but remember he says about this we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you become dull of hearing so he's talking about Jesus as the high priest but he takes a break sets that aside comes over here and says look we got to deal with something and that is that some of you are trying to navigate the Christian faith in some type of mediating type way where you're kind of in and kind of out and he says you're positioning yourself for drifting away from God don't do that so chapter 6 He deals that warning and he comes back in chapter 7 where he looked at life's week and says, look, Jesus is a priest, but he didn't come from Levi, so it's not really like the the true priest that they were experiencing that day. And by the way, according to what we think, the time Hebrews is written, the temple is still active. There's still sacrifices being taken into the temple. This is before 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. All this was very fresh and, and real to them. And so he's not really like these Levites. He's actually more like this mysterious figure that we see in the Old Testament, Melchizedek, who didn't have any lineage, didn't have a beginning, didn't have an end. And so Jesus is a priest, but less like Levites, more like Melchizedek. That's what he's like. Which leads us down to what we said in verse 26, where he begins to tease out what he's really like to have this high priest. And from 726 all the way to chapter 10 and verse 18, what will be about the next five or so uh, paragraph units, sermons inside of this uh, series, he's dealing with this high priest, he's dealing with this idea of what does it mean that Jesus is this supreme priest. And so chapter 8 and verse 1 represents really the end of chapter 7. This is kind of the application, the conclusion, if you will, to his sermon. But it's the beginning of the next section where he begins to describe what Jesus is really like. So go to chapter 8 again and look at verse 1. Now the point of what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest. Now what kind of high priest? Why does he use the word such? He says, well, such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So what's going on in 8, 1 through 6, is teasing out chapter 7 and verse 26, where he says he's exalted above the heavens. The point, the launching point, to teach us what he wants to teach us about Jesus It's really his location, where he is. And let me say the whole sermon in a sentence here, and this sentence really will serve as an outline for the passage. What he's teaching us is this. Here's it in a sentence. Jesus is in heaven. Jesus is not on earth, and it's better that way. Jesus is in heaven, verses 1 through 3, and therefore he's not on earth, verses 4 and 5, and it's better that way, verse 6. So look at verse 1 again. Let's talk about Jesus in heaven. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So what is Jesus doing right now in heaven? Well, three things the text tells us. First of all, it says that he is seated. Now, this... This makes him so different than the Old Testament priest. There was nothing about their function that facilitated any time to to sit down. You couldn't sit down and doing what they did and going into the temple and making sacrifices and especially in the Holy of Holies. No place to sit. So how is Jesus a priest and yet he's seated? Well, the answer is, is that Jesus died on the cross, of course, he rose again. But what we often don't celebrate, what we should, is that after he rose again, he ascended back to the Father. So he he left earth and he went back up into heaven. Now, that wasn't just a means of transportation, the ascension. Rather, it was a demonstration of Jesus' high and exalted position that he won by virtue of the fact of his death and resurrection. So Jesus is seated, first of all, because he won the right to sit at the throne of his father because he is the reigning king of kings and he's the reigning Lord of all lords. He won that virtue, he won that right by the virtue of his death and resurrection. But he's also seated because his work is done. You don't sit down and 
till the work is done, and this is the sense. He's completed this work on the cross, but after this completed work on the cross, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. So, what is Jesus doing uh, right now in heaven? Well, he's sitting, representing that the work is completed, but also he is there at the right hand of the Father, representing that he is exalted King of kings and Lord of lords. This is a direct fulfillment of Psalm 110 that says, sit at my right hand until I make the enemies your footstool. He's waiting for his complete exaltation when he has victory over all of his enemies. The second thing that he's doing is in verse 2. Look at what it says. A minister in the holy places. Now let me stop there. So here's what he's doing. First of all, he's sitting there. But secondly, it says he's a minister. And what does that mean? Well, when you saw the word holy places, in their context, their Jewish context, they knew immediately what it was talking about. That word could be translated sanctuary. The idea was the tabernacle or the temple. So here's what went on. Sometimes it's good to go back and review. So you have Adam in the Garden of Eden, you have the fall, then you have the flood, then you have God creating a new spiritual race and physical race through Abraham, led into Egypt, into bondage, led out of Egypt, and then God takes them, that's what the book of Exodus is about, through their leader Moses, and he says, this is how I want you to relate to me and how I want you to, how I want to relate to you. And God took Moses on the mountain, Mount Sinai, also called Mount Hebron, and he gave him very specific instructions on how he should build a a tabernacle. Now, what's a tabernacle? Well, a tabernacle is, is a tent. It was made of skins and cloth, had tent pegs, had ropes. It was portable. They were nomadic people at that time. They could break it down, set it back up where they were. Very, very specific detailed instructions on what this uh, tabernacle should look like. Then later, Solomon will build a temple. They're now back in, they're into the promised land. God wanted to have, so now this is an official, formal, uh, permanent structure. But before that, they just had a, a, a tabernacle. And so he says, he is in heaven, a minister in the holy places. So Jesus is like a priest, but watch this. In the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So God gave all these instructions on how they should set up the tabernacle. But then the writer of Hebrews comes around and says, you know, understand, there's one true tabernacle, not true in the sense that all that was false, but true in the sense is this is what's real right now. Uh, This is the present reality of the way things exist, that although that tabernacle has gone away, it has no function. There is actually a presence of God where God is there on his throne. His presence is there in the same way that he would manifest his presence inside the tabernacle. His real presence is there inside of the throne. And that's where Jesus is. This is why in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 17, Paul makes it clear in his preaching that God does not dwell in a temple made with hands. Same idea. God is in heaven in a tent that he pitched, in a tent that he set up. The true tent, that's where Jesus is mediating there and doing his ministry there. Now what is Jesus doing there as a minister? Well, let's keep reading. Look at verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. So Jesus is a priest, right? All priests had sacrifices, and so he is a sacrifice. So what he's telling us there, not really teasing it out, but certainly by implication, is that in the same way that priests had sacrifices, Jesus had a sacrifice, but this sacrifice was not something he brought with him. It was... It was himself. So Jesus is in heaven. What is he doing? Well, what he's doing there is he's seated. He's ministering. And he's ministering there as a result of his sacrifice. So there's a sense in which, and this is really helpful theologically, doctrinally, that the work of Christ is completed. And there's another sense in which it's ongoing. Jesus died on the cross. His last words, you know, are, it is what? It is finished. Didn't mean he was finished. It meant that that portion of the plan of God was fully executed. And the reason I can stand here flat-footed and say, if you don't know Jesus, you haven't given your life to him, repent, follow him, you can come to him, because his blood was so powerful and effective that there's nothing you can add to that. 
That's why I can also put my arm around a brother or sister in Christ who's doubtful and insecure and has a weak mind and say, don't you understand, as hard as you work and strive, you can add nothing to the work of Christ. It is finished. You need to embrace what you could never provide for yourself. That's what grace, that's what grace is. So, completed work of Christ. And thinking of VBS, I'm so grateful I was raised in a church that, that taught the gospel so much and so clearly. But those of us that preach the gospel so clearly, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, oftentimes don't emphasize enough of the fact that there is an ongoing work of Christ. And the onward and going Christ is described right there in chapter 7 and verse 26 or verse 25 since he always lives to make intercession for us. What he says there is even more clear in Romans chapter 8, a passage that sometime I hope to study together because the connections between Romans 8 and Hebrews are really incredible. Listen to what it says, verse 34. Who is it to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. <laughs> so here's the, here's the big picture of what's going on. Jesus is in heaven. Why? Well, because his death and resurrection, he executed a plan that provided the floodgates to come open so that you and I could come in, so that we could believe in him, so that we become citizens of the kingdom. But for the kingdom work to continue, for it to prosper, for other people to come into the kingdom, for our prayers to be heard, for us to understand the word of God, for us to worship him, all of those things that we do on here on earth in terms of relating to God and kingdom advance demand that we have an active high priest who is always in the presence of God. And that's why we said last week, it's so encouraging to know that the presence of Jesus beside the throne is as real as the presence of the Father on the throne. And since God will never be off his throne and Jesus will always be by his side and I am in Christ, it means that we always have an audience with the Father, not because we deserve it, not because we're worthy, but because we have an intermediary. We have someone going before us on our behalf. What we learn from the Old Testament temple and tabernacle is that God the Father is completely inaccessible unless someone goes before there's not any one of us here who can just go into the throne room of God and have an audience with him. We can't. But what we could not do for ourselves, Jesus has done for us. He's made a way. So Jesus is in heaven, and what he's doing up there is he is seated, he's ministering, and he's doing all of that because of his sacrifice, both his completed work and his ongoing work. So, Here's the second thing. Jesus is in heaven. He's seating. Here's what else he's doing. He says that not only is he seated there, but also look at verse 4. Jesus is in heaven. But the second thing, the second part of the sentence is he's not on earth. Jesus is not on earth. Verse 4. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown on the mountain. Make a pattern is what he said. There's a pattern by which I want you to model all that's going on there in the tabernacle, the tent, and later on uh, the temple. So Jesus is in heaven and Jesus is not on earth. Now, what is he saying here? What is his point in bringing this up? Well, um, here's his point. Look at verse, it's better to look at this backwards. Look at verse five. God said to Moses, make everything by a pattern. So in Exodus chapter 26 and verse 30, the Bible says that God showed Abraham what the tabernacle was to look like. Now we know he told them because he gave him very specific detailed instructions. They're written down in the end of Exodus it are the people completing it, building the tabernacle that he instructed, all in kinds of intricate details into what it was to look like and how it was to be erected, what materials you should use, and all these fine details in which uh, he should build this tabernacle. So before he built it, Moses saw it. 
It's there in Exodus 26, 30. It's kind of affirmed right here that in some way, was it a vision? I don't know, but, but the implication is he had some visual idea of what it was to look like because as the building inspector, he could go by and say, yes, that's it. That's what, it's, it, that's what God showed me. That's exactly what you should do. And in the same way that Moses was given a pattern and afterwards you should build, here's his logic. Stay with me. Here's the important part. What they were actually building the finished tabernacle and the finished temple was actually a copy itself. It was a pattern. It was a blueprint. It was a schematic. A blueprint is something you can look at and it tells you what the real thing is going to look at. So God's end goal was never the tabernacle. It was never the temple. God's end goal is you to look at this blueprint and see Jesus. Let me borrow a, a metaphor we used before back when we were trying to cover the whole scripture in four sermons in a series called God's Story. Imagine that this is a timeline of the events of the Bible. And you have creation, fall, and flood, and then later God assembling his people, then they're dispersing, and then Jesus finally comes. And we use the metaphor that through all of this, Jesus is about ready to step onto the scene. It's going to come later in the New Testament. He's about ready to step on the scene. The glory of the Father is behind him. And because he's about to come, his shadow is cast over everything that's in the Old Testament. And so as you look at the tabernacle and you look at the temple and all the things it describes about salvation, the inaccessibility of God and how the priest made away from that, what you see all throughout that is, is Jesus. And let me just say as a sidebar, this is why you have to know your Old Testament. Let me repeat what we said last week. If you want to have joy in your Christian life, you have to love Jesus supremely. But if you don't love him and treat him like he's supreme and ultimate in all things, you have to know him. And you can't know him without knowing your Bibles. And so what understanding the Old Testament does is it gives you this greater love of the real thing because these are shadows and copies. And so his point, all the way back into verse 4, the reason why Jesus can't be on earth, he can't be a priest on earth, is because he's a priest on earth, he'd be working with the shadows and the copies, and he's not that. He's the real thing. He's the real thing. That's his point. Now let me, let me take a little point of pastoral privilege here, a little sidebar, uh, to deal with a question that might have come up in your mind. You, you might think... Uh, Pastor, it, it disturbs me to say Jesus is not here. That just doesn't feel right. Because I sense his presence. You ever sense that? You ever been into a place and you just sense the presence of Jesus? No, I have. And we say things like we ask Jesus into our hearts. Um, so how can we actually say that Jesus is not here? Well, anticipating this, Jesus explained this in great detail. It's found in John 14. And so look at it, if you will, for a minute. Let's look at John chapter 14, and then we're going to come back to Hebrews chapter 8. But look at John 14 and verse 12, if you will. John 14 and verse 12. Here's what Jesus said to his disciples. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. That's a strong statement. He seems to be saying that their work in some way would actually be more effective because of his absence. Greater works than these will you do because I'm going to the Father. How in the world could that be the case. Well, look at verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and watch this, will be in you. So we may teach a child, do you want Jesus to come into your heart? You say, Pastor, do you want me to go around and correct all the children of VBS? No, don't be... Don't be, don't be weird. We've got enough people like that in the world. Don't be one of those people. <laughs> but if you want to talk about theological accuracy, which is not unimportant, verse 17 says that it's actually really the Holy Spirit that dwells with inside of us. The Holy Spirit and the Son are both members of the Trinity. They share a uniqueness in that they are unique, if I could use this word, individuals, and yet they share the same essence. They think the same thoughts. And while they're different, I'm comfortable in one sense with this phrase, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of Jesus. 
The reason why I like to say it that way is because as you keep reading, and we will some more in John chapter 15, you can see that the Spirit and the Son had this incredible relationship. It was very clear that the reason why Jesus was going back to the Father is so that the Spirit could come, and when the Spirit came and now for the first time dwelt in them, what we're going to talk about next week in Jeremiah 31 as it's teased out in the rector of chapter 8, all the things that God wanted to do, they could actually do. They could carry out the Holy Spirit and the Son are working together toward the same purposes. So that any time the Spirit is operative, and by the way, if someone gives credit to the Spirit, the Spirit was doing this, the Spirit was moving, you always know if that's true, if the Son is being exalted. Because the Spirit never draws attention to the work of the Spirit. The Spirit draws attention to the Son, and the Son glorifies the Father. And so here, He says, I'm going to be absent from you. I'm not going to be on the earth. I'm going to be in heaven, as we've seen in Hebrews chapter 8. Eight, but the Spirit's going to do all these things. Look at verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And so Jesus was not worried that all the things he had taught them they would forget. The Spirit was going to prompt their memory. And here we are reading the Gospel of John things that John wrote down after Jesus had left. Peace I leave with you, verse 27. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Unbelievable. He just says in verse 28, if you understood how good it was for the Son to be at the Father's right hand, When I told you I wasn't going to be here, you would have rejoiced. Don't know what's behind Jesus' statement there clearly, other than the fact that there is a unity between the Father and the Son that is glorious. Jesus longed to be at his Father's right hand. But we know what comes later after that theologically is this incredible reality. That because Jesus is at the Father's right hand, we really can have a kingdom quest. You understand what we're trying to do here in creating a kingdom advancing gospel culture is not nonsensical, it's not a pipe dream, it's not a hope or a wish, it's a reality. Because Jesus is at the Father's right hand. He's there on our behalf. So, so everything he calls us to execute, he has the power to make that happen in the heavenly places. What a profound thought. Spirit working here through his word, Spirit being led by the Son, the Son interceding for us on behalf of the Father. When we do kingdom work, we literally have all aspects, all three personalities of the Trinity operating together on our behalf. Incredible. I was um, on an airplane a few years ago. It was a long flight, went to the restroom, came out, and there was someone there who clearly by their dress worked for the airline. I Struck up a brief but enjoyable conversation with him on the way back to my seat. We lingered a little bit in that little space uh, there. And as we began to talk, based on what they were saying and how they're dressed, I realized this person was, they were a pilot. And I realized they're talking, they were not just a pilot, but they were a pilot on this flight. And don't get ahead of me here. Um... (laughs) I realized they were not only a pilot, but they were a captain of of that plane. And I was talking to them thinking, you know, I I know what I'm doing here. Um, You know, what what are you doing here? You know, I I would love to not be having this conversation with you, right? I would be blessed by your absence. Because this whole thing is going to be more enjoyable if I'm doing what I'm doing, sitting, and you're doing what you should be doing, which is getting all this thing to where it needs to go. So this is the sense of it. That whatever you're trying to accomplish in your life, pouring into your family, moms and dads, trying to have spiritual victory, breaking a stronghold of sin inside your life, trying to get out of financial bondage, trying to have peace of mind, trying to, to lead us as a body to this kingdom advancing gospel culture, whatever we're attempting for him, understand this, Jesus is at the helm. He's always the captain, he's always the leader, and he's always at the Father's right hand. We are blessed and rejoice, in a sense, in his absence because the Spirit of God reminds us that he is always present with the Father. And for that, we praise him. 
had an interesting thing happen last week. I was coming back from the Southern Baptist Convention from Birmingham to Atlanta, from Atlanta to Little Rock, and as we were sitting down on the flight, I've never seen a captain do this. He actually stood uh, outside of his cockpit, took the speaker there, the, the microphone, and began to talk to us in kind of warm personal tones. It was very interesting. And the reason why he did is because he wanted to let us know that in the cargo hold of that uh, plane, uh, there was a fallen soldier. And we were not just passengers, we were also happened to be people in this transport as they were turning back to his family. They were here somewhere in the state. And we later learned he was an airman himself, and this is why this is so important to him. And so he just took his time. This is what you're going to see when we land. And these are the military protocols involved. And they invited us, if we wanted to, to stay on the plane and just take your time and observe. And so sure enough, we landed and... Um, there uh, on the tarmac was airmen in their dress blues and a hearse and there was a some type of protocols going on that we couldn't see draping of the flag and um, family about 20 of them unfolding chairs other than the tarmac and then riding inside of the plane I didn't realize this but their protocol was that he always had uh, someone to travel with him a partner and so one of his friends who he served with in the theater of conflict uh, was there riding with him and when we landed no one moved he just got up and went, and we watched him outside of the plane doing everything that he did. And I won't share all the details. It's fascinating to me, but I, I want to be respectful of, of their moment. Um, what was interesting, though, is we landed, nobody moved. It's like at least five minutes, nobody moved. They were just locked in on this. Reminding me of a couple of things. Um, first of all, how profoundly grateful we are uh, for those who serve. Um, especially those who give their lives. I mean, we, we couldn't exist as we do. The reason why we can fly planes across our country without fearing any repercussions is because they're serving in ways to keep us profoundly safe. And we owe this debt of gratitude that we can never repay. So, so grateful for them. Um, there's a second thing it reminded me of. When someone makes that sacrifice... We use superlative terms, as we should. The greatest act of valor. The ultimate sacrifice. That's what it is. You've heard it put this way. All gave some, but some gave what? Some gave all. Literally, for that soldier, for that airman, there's nothing more he could have given than he gave. So this is what makes Jesus so unique. When Jesus ascended back into the Father, there is nothing more he could have given than he gave. There's nothing Jesus has for you later that he has not already provided for you. It's complete. It's done. He made the ultimate sacrifice. He gave all. And yet what makes Jesus unique and therefore worthy of more glory and more praise than all the soldiers in all the world who gave this tremendous sacrifice. What made him so glorious is that he could not ultimately die. He had victory over death, and that victory over his death, after he gave all, he stands in heaven, and he's still working on our behalf. Now, that's incredible. He expended himself, he gave all that he had, but he sits in heaven because if he were not interceding at the Father's right hand, you and I could not exist as believers. We have no one going inside the true tent that the Lord set up to intercede on our behalf. And so we praise him. We praise him. Because Jesus is in heaven. <laughs> He's not on earth. And verse 7, it's, it's better that way. It's better that way. Father God, we are grateful for all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you that Jesus was high and then he came low and humbled himself. And based on his humiliation and the depth to which he came, you've exalted him in a high position and there he is at your right hand. And Jesus, we praise you. Thank you, Jesus, for making it possible that we could have a relationship with you.
This is a moment we've dedicated as a time of response. God is calling you to respond to his word. How do you want to respond? Maybe as some um, I learned after the service, you want to to join this church. You want to make yourself a part of this church family. We'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a member here. Love to have that conversation. And so in a minute, we're going to stand. Um, just Just a second, our pastors will be here down the front. You just come and take them by the hand and we'll talk about what it means to be a member of this church. There are others that you just need to make this altar, your altar of prayer. Maybe all that overwhelms you in this life, you've been able to put in the right perspective, and that is that really God is is still in control. Jesus is still leading in all of this. He's always at the helm. Maybe this morning for you is about praising Him and worshiping for that and putting all that is on your plate and in your life and in your mind under, beneath the reality that Jesus is leading It'll never leave us. And there are others here. You need to give your life to Christ. This is your moment right now. You've, you've never bowed the knee to Jesus. And you need to say right now in this moment, Jesus, I, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. I want you to save me. And if that's the case, this is your moment. Just do that right now. Our pastors here at the front, they'd love to talk to you about what it means to have a relationship with Christ. If that's the case, when we stand, you don't wait or hesitate or look around. You just step out and you just come. Give your life to Christ. Father God, we love you. And Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that our hearts would be full as we completely and fully respond to you. And we pray because of him. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we sing. If God's leading you to come, wherever you are, you just step out. You just come.